Uh, thank you all for coming out, and my particular thanks to LSE Ideas and to Saracen and partners, particularly Guy Monson, for including me today. Um, as someone who's been an Anglophile in the broad sense for a long time and served here, as you may know, for a few years at the Bank of England, this is not as painful as it is for some of you, but it is painful for me to be having to address this topic. But let's start with getting our minds around it. As uh, Simon Hicks pointed out, you know, there's this huge multicollinearity, to use LSE speak, um, between what your education level is, what your income level is, where you live, and how likely you were to vote for leave versus remain. And disentangling those kinds of issues is going to be a project professors here, I assume, will undertake. But what I want you to all understand is, assuming based on income, education, location, that most of you here are remain types, uh, even as remain types, you vastly overestimate the importance of the UK. And I think that, unfortunately, I'm just putting on, I'm not tweeting while talking. I'm just putting on my stopwatch so I don't go over. Um, I think it's, it, it, I, I've had this repeatedly, whoops, I've had this repeatedly uh, during my conversations in the run-up to the, to the referendum and having arrived in the UK a couple days ago. And that's not meant to be snide. In fact, it's very sad. But it's important to understand that the idea that Europe has to get something for the UK, that the special relationship remains, that any of these things are very viable absent a commitment of Britain to the liberal international order and to liberal values in a leading way is fallacy. Um, it doesn't mean Britain becomes a pariah state, obviously, and everybody has spent decades talking about empire without a role or a role without an empire or some variant combination of thereof, the Norway model, whatever you want, but unfortunately, one has to recognize that there will be a diminishment fundamentally in Britain's global role, and this has major economic effects on the world and makes the world worse off, but it will still happen. The second thing I want to point out is that I basically agree with what, what, what Guy and Swati said in terms of the economics, and this also is an important cautionary note. The extent to which I disagree with them, I, I basically agree with almost all of it, is that this is a real shock. Economists tend to make a distinction between what we call monetary or nominal things and real things. So think about City of London Central Bank versus industrial decisions, including services, outside of the City of London and the ministry of, of the Vince Cable used to run. I can't remember its name now. Um, these are different things. And what we're seeing this time is, as various people have mentioned, a investment strike. Domestic residential investment, domestic corporate investment, foreign direct investment in the UK, all of this is under fundamental shift. And so an exchange rate move, a large exchange rate move, cushions and speeds that adjustment, but it doesn't fully make up for it. And so I've been talking a lot about the UK, so now let me bring it to the rest of the world. And let me emphasize the US and China, because unfortunately, size matters. So let's start with the US. The direct effects of the US, on the US economy of this event are obviously very small. Uh, the direct trade links between US and UK are very small. Coming out of the banking crisis, as Governor Carney correctly noted last week, uh, the banking systems, not just in the UK, but elsewhere in the Western world, are largely far better capitalized, far less leveraged, far more monitored than they were 10 years ago. Um, so the direct financial effects are also quite limited. The effects, if any, on financial markets are likely to come through money flowing into the US from the UK and elsewhere in the usual safe haven fashion, which will put a small drag on US economy in the short term, partially offset by lower interest rates and a delay in Fed rate hike expectations. So this is not a big deal for the US economy. But again, to repeat my earlier point, in economic policy and global economic relations, the special relationship is diminished 
because the UK is less special to the international liberal order than it was. And this is not because of Europe, this is because of what fueled the choice that was made. That it was about immigration, that it ignored economics, and that it fought back against the idea that sovereignty must increasingly be shared. And so when we think about that in economic real terms, you think about the UK's vast overrepresentation at the IMF and the World Bank and in various institutional arrangements coming out of the Bretton Woods system, and the idea was we, the U.S., wanted the U.K. there punching above its weight because the values it promoted, and if those values have shifted, the utility of the U.K. punching above its weight is negative. Do not forget your history. Coming out of World War II, go read Skidelsky's third volume of the Keynes biography. Go read about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Go read about Woodrow Wilson after World War I. There was a long history of the U.S. trying to diminish the U.K.'s role, not expand it. This is an accident of the post-war settlement. Accident's unfair because there were notable leaders in U.S. and U.K. Who, who made that happen. That is gone, or it may be gone, or it certainly eroded. This comes to, a ver to two very big feedbacks in the U.S. case, where I think is the real action. The first is the concern about the U.K. becoming an opportunist country. We already saw a little bit of this in terms of the UK's reaction to the Asian Investment Infra Infrastructure Investment Bank. Hmm. Put in the wrong pin, can't see my stopwatch. Okay. Um, that I was on record and I fully believe the US should have supported the creation of this Chinese led institution and it was fine for other countries to sign up. But the UK obviously leapt ahead and said, oh, we want to get in good with the Chinese and we're not going to coordinate with others and we're going to do this. That kind of thing will now be expected more and more. Would that we will expect a UK that is trying to be seeing a large share of its business in the city moving to other financial capitals, be they in Edinburgh or Dublin, or be they in Frankfurt and Paris, and is going to be desperate to retain that business and will undercut regulations and supervisory standards. That will be a threat. There will be a number of things where there could be a potentially a very negative dynamic for the UK and that will quickly erode a lot of the goodwill, at least in the international economic sphere, that both the EU and the US have for the UK. It is impossible to talk about the US in this vote without talking about Trump and his movement. All of you are very well aware of the parallels. Many people here are much more qualified to talk, than I to talk about the politics, but I would make two points. The first is, we have to be very concerned, does this matter to Trump's election prospects? Probably not much. If you're someone who's going to vote for Trump or someone who cares about voting for Trump, you probably are not paying much attention to anything that happens outside U.S. borders. <laughs> no, I, it, sad but true. Uh, but at the margin, I think you do have to be concerned, and I, I realize I'm saying something that's quite potentially inflammatory. But this is like Mussolini being reelected in the 20s in Italy. Mussolini gets reelected, and a bunch of people, including some notable British and American states people at the time, said, you know, he said a lot of things rhetorically, but he actually wasn't that bad. The world didn't come to an end. And the fact that people could point to Mussolini getting freely elected and being sort of acceptable and not leading to the end of the world made it, frankly, in explicit terms, if you go back in the history, easier for Hitler to run in Germany in 1930 and 1933, easier for the Francoists, of course, they took power militarily, but to have political support in Spain. And so there is a worry. May I have 60 more seconds? Uh, that's the problem with self-confirming uh, deadlines. Um, <laughs> The problem is that this makes some people who potentially might not have voted for Trump or had hesitancy saying, look, a major democracy, hell, an English-speaking democracy of mostly people who look like me voted for such a platform, spoke out against immigration. It is acceptable. It's not the end of the world. Maybe I'll do this. That's the big worry. That's the channel through which this happens. The alternative, like my colleague Swati, I'll end on a slightly positive note. 
but it's not a good one for the UK. The alternative is the UK becomes the object lesson. That the economy craters, relations with Europe get very bad, the governing class looks ungovernable, um, and it is then in the interests of electoral candidates, be it in the US or Western Europe, to say, sure as hell don't end up like the UK. And that may be the best that the US and others will get out of this. Look for a commercial from Hillary Clinton to that effect coming soon. I wish I could be more optimist. The one piece of hope I would say is, and again, I defer to, to Simon and Tim and other political scientists, but from the outside looking in, a new general election genuinely fought on the issues of union, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and remain, whatever the result of that would be, would be a hugely strong step for the rest of the world to say the UK is making decisions and does have, the government does have legitimacy. Short of that, it's very hard for me to see how the UK remains a trusted partner of anyone, let alone in a special relationship. Thank you. Since your self-imposed uh, 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 timetable deadline cut you short, could you say a bit about what the effect on China might be? Okay, that's for Adam. I guess so. Uh, thank you for indulging me. Um, I think the effects on China are, are threefold. Uh, in the short term, this helps mildly at the margin that there will be both more effort of what my colleague Fred Bergson calls competitive liberalization. There will be more people trying to make deals with China because it's just an environment in which people want to make deals. I mean trade deals and other deals. And the UK, to some degree, could end up bidding against Germany on things. Second, and more broadly, the key issue is um, the flip side of what I said about opportunism and the example of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. That whether it's the Chinese regime or Mr. Putin in Russia, you have a bunch of countries that, for whom economic instability is probably not good, but weaker political power in the West and less coherence in the West it presents opportunities. And I don't need to be terribly ascribing terribly nasty motivations to the Chinese. To Putin, I have no problem ascribing terribly nasty motivations. I can just describe very normal, perfectly reasonable motivations to the Chinese government, and it will be in their interest, whether it's getting support and greater voice in various international institutions, or bidding wars between Boeing and Airbus, depending where British aerospace is, or exchange rate arrangements when the pound is crashing, they will be in a position to get better deals and just look opportunistically for that. The final thing is, again, to be cosmic, and there are people at LSE who, who can do this better than I can, but just in the same sense of object lesson. Mr. Xi in China and his coterie have been pushing very hard on the idea that Western notions of democracy screw up. Uh, they've been very explicit about this in various forms over past months. Uh, I think this will be used as another propaganda point in that regard. But if I can also ask you, um, if you're willing, if you could comment on the consequences um, that the economy will have on the security panorama that uh, David just painted. I, I, I've, I'll, thank you very much, Susan. Um, I'm already a little trepidatious, having gone as far into foreign policy as I did, so uh, I'll be a little careful and try to keep it back to economics. Um, I think, like David, it's important to say what the UK decision comes on top of in terms of general economic trends, both in terms of the UK and the world, and how this may or may not probably does complicate them. I, I think the, the most important thing to remember for the UK and for all of us is that there has been a huge slowdown in productivity growth throughout the Western world, and also in China, also in Japan. And while I was at the Bank of England on the MPC, I expressed the UK's productivity performance was dreadful. And I, as well as some other members of the committee at the time, better known to you, 
expressed skepticism, that this couldn't make any sense. You know, why, why we didn't wake up one day, as I put it, with all British workers having lost their left arms, God forbid. So why was productivity down? There were a bunch of measurement issues, there were a bunch of questions. But I have to admit, now that we've gotten this many years out and from the crisis, and the UK's productivity rate is so low, growth rate is so low, and so many other major economies are suffering the same thing, you have to say, okay, something real is going on here. And in this context, you know, there's all this talk, just as in the US, that you know, whether it's Washington or Brussels, if we could just get the dead hand of, of bureaucracy and regulation off our backs, maybe we'd have this huge leap forward in efficiency. That's certainly true in some specific areas, and, and it's certainly very hard for a bank to make a profit when you're having to spend a third of your workforce, essentially, on, on various forms of compliance. I mean, there are things out there, but the fact remains, cross-sectionally, the U.S. and the U.K. have some of the most deregulated, most liberalized economies in the world, and it's not like they've had huge amounts of additional regulation imposed on them in recent years, and yet we've seen this huge fall in productivity growth. So. One has to be concerned that, going back to stuff Swami Swati said, that anything that interferes with competition and, and, and trade across more borders is going to make that worse. And that's a shame and it's difficult and it is unrealistic to pretend that somehow the UK will escape this when it, it, it is not Brussels activities in the last few years that led to what has happened to UK productivity. <clears throat> the second thing is to speak about um, potency of monetary policy. Again, this isn't just a UK issue. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there that the Bank of England maybe could ride to the rescue. That they're going to cut rates, they're going to reinitiate QE, there'll be a recession, of course, but that the Bank of England, will, along with the exchange rate drop, will offset this. And this is the one place where I dare to differ a bit from Guy's presentation, and, and I am an outlier. Um, as much as I may be known for having been an advocate of quantitative easing and stimulus during the crisis, I have severe doubts about how effective it will be in the current context for the UK. That if you are already getting the exchange rate movement, but investment from real businesses is going down because of genuine uncertainty and genuine change in the environment. And if households, and I think this was on Guy's slide, are engaged in precautionary saving, they're very t scared about what's going to happen to them, then all the things that we talked about in the UK and the US about why QE or other forms of monetary policy don't really work because you're, you're pushing on a string, to use the phrase, that, 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 that people are very intent on sitting on their cash whatever you do, and therefore monetary policy is not very effective. And I think, again, this is a global problem we've seen. We've seen this in Japan, we've seen this in the US, we've seen this in the UK. It's, I would argue, I'm actually believe past measures were more effective than what many people think, but I don't think in this context it's likely to be very effective for the UK, except through the exchange rate channel, and then you know, that only goes so far. And of course, you can trace this back and say, well, the two go together. If there's a productivity slowdown and people are less willing to invest, therefore monetary policy is less effective at stabilizing the economy, therefore people are less willing to invest, therefore you get less productivity growth. You unfortunately start seeing a negative downward cycle, which arguably is the kind of thing that's happening. A, a, a final point going to David's quite rightly reminding us about divergence and, and disdain. Um, I think it's important to recognize, so I know Branko Milosevic spoke here at the, at the school recently. Um, you know, there is an argument out there that, that what's driving this is, is globalization causes inequality. That, that basically the rural, I don't know the ABC class system, but what in the US we would call the rural working class or the ex-urban lower middle class are hit, and it's particularly older white people, um, while the rest of the world has been gaining. And obviously the people in London gain compared to everyone else, and there's real something there. But we do have to also point out that the world is not solely economically determined. 
that there were other groups in society, women, people of color, in the past who were relatively deprived or who didn't have progress on inequality and who did not react in this fashion. And we have to look at the fact that a lot of this backlash we're seeing, and again, others may disagree, but my reading of the data is about relative status. It, it's about, and this may be more true in the US than the UK, but I think it holds for both. That it's about white, less educated males who default had status and privilege and relative power and money in society, who frankly, it's not just they're not doing well, it's others are catching up with them. And frankly, if you're going to pursue justice and let others fully compete and be supported, that gap is going to close. So we're left with a very real dilemma of less spoils, less stabilization of the business cycle. How do you buy these people off? But also, how do you buy them off without essentially, to use the phrase moral hazard, that you're encouraging the people who forced everyone else to adjust not to adjust? So it's a very difficult set of affairs that Brexit doesn't help, but can be seen as part of.